All right, good morning. Here we are again with our 31 days of wisdom from the book of Proverbs, and we're on day 10. And I am Pastor Roy Smith of True Light Christian Fellowship Church, and I will let my guests today introduce themselves, tell you a little bit about who they are. I'll start with the pretty lady to my right. I am Mrs. Pastor Roy Smith <laughs> from True Light Christian Fellowship. I'm Carla. And I'm uh, Michael Sanchez. I'm the youth pastor here at the church. I'm cousin Pastor Roy Smith. Uh, by way of Carla, <laughs> my name is James Wells. I'm associate pastor here at True Light Christian Fellowship. Through the, the days that go by in this month that you will see us in the book of Proverbs, to those of you who, are, who will be uh, visiting our site and uh, hopefully learning from uh, our discussions and writing down those things and holding those things that you learn, one of the things that you will, uh, that will project from us is our personalities and the joy and the laughter that you see in the different various groups of people that will be up here is genuine and it's real. We are we're on staff together, we work together like this and have for years and it's not a fraudulent behavior that we are uh, implementing because or showing you because we're on camera but this kind of joy is an everyday adventure. Uh, at our church. Wouldn't you say, Michael, that we come here with a different adventure every day? For sure. For sure. All right. Carla has to keep us kind of calm down. She's the level headed one probably among all of us. And, uh, and that's scary. <laughs> and that's scary, yeah. Well, let's engage. Uh, this is week 10, dealing with a collection of proverbs that are not necessarily toward a certain aim, but this 10th chapter or 10th number of, so of uh, Proverbs deals with a whole collection of ideas and concepts of Solomon's wisdom. And we're going to read through, I'll start out and we read a few and then just kind of pass it on to y'all and let us share in the reading of this, uh, this 10th chapter of, of Proverbs. Can we do that? And we'll do it in the same order that y'all introduced you, yourselves. Solomon's Proverbs, a wise son brings joy to his father, but a foolish son, heartache to his mother. Ill-gotten gains do not profit anyone, but righteousness rescues from death. The Lord will not let the righteous go hungry, but he denies the wicked what they crave. Idle hands make one poor. But diligent hands brings riches. The son who gathers during summer is prudent. The son who sleeps during harvest is disgraceful. Blessings are on the head of the righteous, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. The remembrance of the righteous is a blessing, but the name of the wicked will rot. A wise heart accepts commands but foolish lips will be destroyed. The one who lives with integrity lives securely, but whoever perverts his ways will be found out. Carla? I'm going to read from your translation, so it'll be the same. A sly wink of the eye causes grief, and foolish lips will be destroyed. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Hatred stirs up conflicts, but love covers all offenses. Wisdom is found on the lips of the discerning, but a rod is for the back of the one who lacks sense. The wise store up knowledge, but the mouth of the fool hastens destruction. The wealth of the rich is his fortified city, the poverty of the poor is their destruction. The reward of the righteous is life. The wages of the wicked is punishment. The one who follows instruction is on the path to life. But the one who rejects correction goes astray. The one who conceals hatred has lying lips. And whoever spreads slander is a fool. 
When words are many, sin is not absent, but he who holds his tongue is wise. Hmm. The tongue of the righteous is cho- his choice silver, but the heart of the wicked is of little value. Hmm. The lips of the righteous nourish many, but fools die for lack of judgment. The blessing of the Lord brings wealth, and he adds no trouble to it. A fool finds pleasure in evil conduct, but a man of understanding delights in wisdom. What the wicked dreads will overtake him. What the righteous desire will be granted. When the storm has swept by, the wicked are gone, but the righteous stand firm forever. As vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so is a slugger to those who sin him. The fear of the Lord adds length to life, but the years of the wicked are cut short. Amen. The, hope of the, the hope of the righteous shall be gladness. The expectation of the wicked shall perish. The way of the Lord is strength to the upright, but destruction shall be to the workers of iniquity. The righteous shall never be removed, but wicked shall not inhabit the earth. The mouth of the just bringing forth wisdom, but the four tongues shall be cut out. The lips of the righteous know what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked speaketh forwardness. Amen. Thank you all for helping me to get through that that proverb. Now, let's gaze at particular things that caught um, our interest. And I'll begin this and kind of ask you some questions and and you, y'all, I want to hear your resounding uh, compliments or comments, rather, on this. It talks about the wise son brings joy to his father, but a foolish son, heartache uh, to his mother. What is that? What is it? I, uh, I really didn't want to answer this one because as I read it, it got real close to home to me. Um, I know both sides of this. Okay. Um, the foolish son is the heaviness of the mother. I remember that part of my relationship with my mom. Okay. That single mother causing the trouble I did, having her go through the things she did. And as I was reading it, I thought about the grace and mercy God gave me to s- for her to see my life in Christ before she left this earth. The joy it brought her. The, the 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 weight lifted off her shoulders to see mm-hmm. that okay I don't have to be concerned no more I, the the burden of making sure he's okay is no longer my problem now I went from having to look out for him to be able to count on such a person and then in that same light I saw my daddy reach out to me as a proud father as. Now that you're walking in the paths of a preacher or a pastor yourself in that arena, right. walk with me. Mm-hmm. Come walk with me. I, that, 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 that desire to let people know who you are now as my son is a, is a prideful moment or a, a gracious moment in his life now because you're no longer affliction on the family name. All right, all right. Good. Anybody else on that one? A wise son brings joy to his father. But a foolish son, heartache to his mother. I think that the <coughs> the word son is not necessarily gender specific. Right. That um, it could be son or daughter. And we do bring joy or shame or heartache to our parents by the way we behave. As, as a parent myself, you know what kind of heartache um, you carry for your children. I think in the in the book of John when it says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Like that is such a true and real, real statement. And to take this even higher, translate this to our Heavenly Father. Right. And my behavior causing him grief when I walk in disobedience to him. Regardless of what other people say is right or wrong, mm-hmm. what does he say is right or wrong? And sometimes they are not the same. Right. They are not the same. Even for myself, there are certain things I want to do or ways I want to behave that I know are not pleasing to him. They would be pleasing to me. They're pleasing to the flesh. But when I 
walk in obedience toward him, the joy I have knowing that he is pleased with me yeah. is insurmountable. All right. Mike? Yeah. It's, this verse is cool to me, Pastor, because it, there's no uh, age restriction. Right. Um, this applies in every season of life. That's right. It applies, when you, it applies as you're a child, as you're a young person growing up, yeah. as you're an older person. Even James, like you alluded to your mother, um, she's gone to be with the Lord. It, it still applies. Yes, you know, um, This can still happen. And there's no uh, prerequisite as to what kind of mother or father on earth you had or have. Mm -hmm. um, it still applies to you, regardless if you see them as the greatest mother or father on earth that ever lived or they just failed. Yeah. Um, this can still happen yeah. on, your, yeah. on, your, <coughs> on your portion, right? And then like Ms. Carla said, um, to our Heavenly Father, what is it that we are speaking uh, to his people or to people with our life about our daddy? You know, what is that looking like? Uh, what are we saying about our father? Um, the way we conduct ourselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Let me kind of change lanes on it. Same issue, but a little different look at the approach. What is it? C because what I'm about to talk to you about, I feel like, has been lost in the culture in which we live as, as Americans. What has happened to the la to the to parental respect by children what what caused it and not all together but what are some causes and why why do young people not respect the wisdom that's passed on to them through their parents lives why is that so absent I'll All right, start. Michael. I'll get the party started. Uh, I think part of the reason is uh, Pastor Roy is number one. It, it's it's rarely seen passed down now. Right. Um, that portion of our culture now is absent from where your culture it was. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. was there. Yeah. It was obvious. Uh, I see my grandparents and and the way that my uncles and my father handle them and treat them and how we were required to handle them and treat them as well. Uh, something as simple as that. There's things that you don't, you don't do. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't enter into a conversation uh, wrongly with my grandparents. Right. Even if they're dead wrong. Right. It's not going to happen. And I even look at my kids now, um, same thing with my aunts and uncles. I look at my kids now, how they handle their aunts and their mm -hmm. uncles. Okay. And I have to constantly correct them. Right. Um, because over the years, it's deteriorating. And speaking honestly, my generation doesn't demand the respect right. that my aunts and uncles did. Good point. With our lives, with their lives. And just by their position of Very who they good. are in our family. It's Very not, good. It's not a requirement anymore as it should be. That's, okay. that's one of the issues. Okay. D go ahead. Yes, and, 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 and as, you, as you were saying there, Mike, our generation, we don't want to put forth, we don't want to put forth the effort in in being it because if I require if I require you to be respectful, that means I have to constantly be there with you to make sure it's happening. Or I have to constantly walk that way for you to see it. Okay. But if I if I then got lazy with it and said, you know, that's too much work for me or too much for me to do. I, I've always said one of the reasons we don't punish, like our kids to be on punishment now, mm -hmm. is because that means I got to be on punishment with you. There you go. And so in order for that not to happen, then just don't do it again. You're right. Now you go do what you're going to do so I can do what I'm going to do. And we'll avoid it. We'll avoid it all together. Yeah. Carla, you have any more remarks on this one? Yeah, just in addition to a whole lot of things, and you said that this is not conclusive, we're just talking about some of the issues. There has been a cultural breakdown that started a long time ago with a disregard or disdain for authority. And so that has transcended into the family. It's, it's in every area, in every walk of, of our lives. We can see it. And... Um, with the spiritual eye, you can really see it. Right. 
there's just a breakdown for respect of authority and actually I hate authority. So whatever authority, whatever represents authority, I don't want it. Starting with the word of God. Mm -hmm. If God's going to tell me that I shouldn't do certain things, then I don't want any part of God. If the church is going to demand certain things in my life, I don't want any part of that either. I don't want to, I don't want any part of anything that's going to, to, um, not let me fulfill my own selfish desire. Unfortunately, this whole breakdown started in Genesis. Yeah. <laughs> it one did. One. And so a, a lot of it is just a disdain for authority. And then that transcends and it's piped into the homes through television, through television shows, through, and now it's just wide open with all the social media access that, that young people have and adults have. We are validated in our rebellion. Yeah. And because we're validated in our rebellion, because all these people over here are being rebellious too, then I'm empowered to rebel against what you say is good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one more thing I thought of, Pastor Roy, as we're speaking about okay. this. Um, another huge impact as why this is not being passed down, handled correctly, is the, the breakdown of the family. Okay. The breakdown of the family, particularly the breakdown of the position of the man in the family. Yeah. Good. And our culture, like when Ms. Carla said, what we're seeing in our culture through television and through these phones and, and through the assistance of our government. There you go. Assistance, right? They're assisting our culture to further break down our family mm -hmm. by providing um, what they term as assistance. Right. Um, they're assisting the breakdown of the family not to stay together and not to work and fight for what the American dream once was. Okay, cool. And what, it, and what it still should be. I understand. I understand. Well, Michael, I noticed something. You're, you mind saying your age on? <laughs> yes, sir. I just turned 37 years old. You are 37 year old. You're 37 years old. You have a wife. I do. How many children you have? I have two kids. Two kids. How old are they? Uh, Noah is 16. My son and my daughter is 13. So you have a 16 year old and a 13 year old, yet you still say yes ma'am and no ma'am to Miss Carla. I was noticing that as you were speaking to her and about her. Where did that come from? It came from my mom and my daddy. From your mother and your yeah. father. They, they, that's how they instructed us. That, that is how you should handle your elders. It's kind of lost in our culture, isn't it? And then we, but we have a sector of my age group mm -hmm. that if you say yes ma'am to me, Oh, don't tell me yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Don't call me Miss Carla. Call me Carla. Mm -hmm. I want to be. I don't. I don't even want the respect that I'm due based on my age, you know. And hopefully, the way I live also. But we don't even want that anymore. You know what I say when people tell me that? What? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> now you say it anyway, don't you? Absolutely, Jim. You're trying my to say mom something. Tell them you need to talk to my mama because I'm not changing. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 and, and what you're saying is so true because it's a battle because you can teach your kids to do that. And then they'll know around certain people, or if I'm around mom and dad, I have to do it, or certain people. But then you go to your, your school systems, and I walk in and I introduce myself. My son is required to say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, and yes, sir, to you as a teacher. Mm -hmm. Well, sir, I, we don't require that. No, no, that's not what I'm saying, though. Mm -hmm. My son, but when she got 45 kids, that's not a concern of hers. Mm -hmm. So then... It's like what I've done all summer to train him to be that way gets broke down throughout the school year to where, and as you say, now that now that it's just part of his conversation, he comes home and he's getting popped in the mouth because didn't I tell you? you. <laughs> yeah. Well, what about this? What Do you think that parental disrespect toward God has played any role in the demise of children disrespecting parents. Explain. Because parents no longer go to church, they don't regard God's concepts as truth, they don't implement God's concepts as the foundation for family, the foundation for right and wrong. Do you think that a lack of these concepts coming down from God to the parents and that no longer existing has played into a disrespect of children toward parents. Yes, sir. Okay. There's a phrase that you use. Sorry, Michael. There's a phrase that you use a lot called a moral frame of reference. Yeah. When the moral frame of reference is removed, 
you have no moral frame of reference. And where do we get you that moral frame? From here. You have nowhere to get your morality from, and so you it, it, it goes, reverts to the end of the book of Judges, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. And so if, if we have to have a premise. Even someone that tells me I'm not a believer, I don't mm -hmm. believe in God, mm -hmm. I'm just a good person. I help the, the poor. I do all the, Who told you that was good? That's good. How do you know that's good? That's your, that's your opinion. That's good right there. Well, it is good. Okay, who told you? There is a moral frame of reference that said that was good, that you borrowed from even though you don't even realize you did. Mm -hmm. Because another man will say that to go out and rape 30 women is good. Yeah. Is that good? Well, no, that's bad. Who said it was bad? What's the moral frame of reference for that? That has to come from somewhere, and it comes from here. Amen. Okay. Michael, did, were you going to say something on that? Just, just adding to what Ms. Carla says. Whenever okay. you don't have that reference, the standard, mm -hmm. then we're allowed to make our own standard. Amen. And any standard that we set is not good enough. That's true. So we can go through life or set an example of life for our children that this is the standard right here because this is what I said it is. And compared to God's standard, you're like in the dirt. Yes. At best. Right. Yes. So that that's not that's not good. So you gotta be when, when you when, when you phrase that question, that's <coughs> often in my prayer. It, when even when in everybody tell me how great my kids are, they bad to me though. But even when I see them do wrong, my first thought is, okay, what did I mess up? Mm -hmm. What did you see in me that I wasn't doing with God that made you think this was right? Right. To do. And 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 we, a lot of parents won't check themselves like that because mm -hmm. then I'm required to step my game up, or do better, right. or get be uncomfortable doing certain things. Now that I see this in my child, that's, that's crazy, but that's true. Um, okay, so the parenting is a task of sort, a task in a sense. Not that we don't love our children, or that it's it's. It's uh, cumbersome to raise children, but we have a responsibility in the task of raising children, not just to them, but to God who gave them as a gift to us. Now, this text talks about the son, or as Carla made mention, that it's not gender specific because it says sons, but it really means just talking about children. And then it talks about... Um, in verse 6, idle hands make one poor, but diligent hands bring riches. The, from here, from the 10th uh, chapter of the book of Proverbs on through the end of the book, more of the uh, Proverbs are individualized rather than what we've been looking at the concept of the whole. When you enter the 10th chapter, you enter an individualistic look at the Proverbs of wisdom and understanding as they relate to individuals on earth, sons, daughters, men, women, daughter, however it may work out. And so you, he enters a, a realm of script, scripture dealing with riches and the poor, you know, or the rich and the poor, wealth versus the lack of wealth. Uh, and he starts to indicate to us that idleness is not good. Being in one place continually is not good. So he says in verse 6, idle hands make one poor. What does hands represent in this particular? Verse 4, I'm sorry, I said 6, yes. What does that represent? Idle hands? What is he talking about? Idle hands make one poor? Legs are sorry. Okay. I to find a pretty way to say it, and I couldn't come up with it. <laughs> Legs. Okay. Idle hands versus diligent hands. What's the reasoning here in this scripture in verse 4? Basically, Pastor, that a man who's trying to be a person that pleases his father mm -hmm. can't do it standing still. Okay. It takes movement. It takes action. It takes work. Okay. It takes sacrifice. Those things are required um, to not be a poor man. Gotcha. Gotcha. Makes sense. Makes sense to me. Right. And that you, can, you can look that in the, in, the, in the eternal and the spiritual. It applies probably more so in the physical. But a lot of people in the physical don't have because they're lazy. Yeah. OK. And I, I agree with that fully for a person. 
for a person to be in a place or position themselves as lazy is that forethought. It takes a bunch of work to be lazy. Okay, so when you, it just don't happen that you're lazy. You, you got to think about it. You have to think you about being think lazy. Gotta, it takes more effort to be lazy. After what we read, and I can't remember it's chapter 5 or 6, it takes way more effort to be lazy than it is just to get up and get it done. Okay, so this, this verse 4 talks about those hands. Idle, idle hands can cause you to live in poverty. Idle hands. If you go back up to verse 3, it says, the Lord will not let the righteous go hungry. I think if you go back to verse 4, latter part of it, that says, but diligent hands bring riches. What are you talking about, hands that move? What does that mean, Carla? Well, um, moving away from the spiritual connotation that Michael was using and going into the, uh, the, the carnal side of that or the physical side of that, even in in history, God provided a way for the poor to eat. Yes. You know, the scripture says the poor will be with you always. So they had nothing. Yes, right. And God didn't say, okay, you that have something and you that have wealth or riches, I want you to go and I want you to give it to them mm -hmm. because they're poor. Right. And they need it. But he made a way and he told those that, that had, when you glean your field, mm -hmm. Don't glean the corners, right. the edges. You leave it for the poor. Now, the poor had to go get it. That was something? They had to actually go. God made a way for them. Right. But it wasn't just given to them. They still had to go and work for the food so, they could, so that they could eat. And so, I mean, you, you can't just do nothing. Yes, there are going to be poor people. There are going to be people without. But God never commanded that they just be given something. Okay. I, uh, I'm sitting there laughing about a joke that Mom Mert and Carla used to talk about all the time and the difference in life now. Even when we first started, you had to go wait in line for a check. Mm -hmm. You had to at least go up. You couldn't sit at home and wait for it to hit your account or hit your card. Not true you anymore. Had, yeah, you had to get up, go wait in line because I remember the joke. Oh, I ain't going to say it because we'll... <laughs> but my grandma was like, I'm not going to go wait in no line to get a check. Because in her mind then, that was too lazy. Right. But now you just, people don't even get up to do that. They just sit at home. And why wait for, check my phone to see if it's hit the account yet. Or check the card to see if it's mm -hmm. any money on it yet. You, if it, so it's like you're getting worse and worse. Are you telling me the culture in which we live in is hindering poor people from being successful? I would say that, yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Would it helps make them lazy? I believe so. And, you know, every situation is different. different. There's okay. no blanket right. in, the, in this thing to cover yep. everybody. Correct. Um, but what I think what the scripture is saying generally is, um, or let, me say, let me start by what it's not saying. It's not saying if you do this, you're going to be rich. Right. If you do this, you're going to be part of the Bless Me Club and you don't have to worry about anything. That's not right. what it's saying. Absolutely. What it's saying in general is, the life that's spiritually driven, that's righteous, driven by God, is going to be better Amen. than the life of the wicked. Right. It, at least, it, 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 and I agree with what you're saying, because at least up in verse 3, it says, the Lord will let the righteous, he will not let the righteous go hungry. Sometimes riches is just eating. It's just being able to mm -hmm. eat. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because... Was Go ahead. Psalm that said that when it said that God gives us power to get wealth, and that the word wealth meant to be able to eat, be able to have a shelter. It, it wasn't a rich a word about right. riches. The word wealth it says so. God gives you power in order. I give you enough energy to get up off your tail to go be able to make some type of provision mm -hmm. for yourself. <coughs> yes, I'm God. I can do all that. All right. And for some people, I've, I've had to. And at some point in your life, I might, at some point in your life, I might have to. But as long as you can get up, as long as I can breathe the breath of life into you, for you to get up, and you got movement in your limbs, get up and go okay. get you something to eat. Makes sense to me. The Bible speaks of, and we talk about in our culture, legacy. 
is addressed here in this 10th chapter of Proverbs in verse 7, where he says, the remembrance of the righteous is a blessing, or the legacy of the righteous is a blessing. Michael, how do you want your kids to remember you? I want them to remember me as being real, as being uh, a father that loved them. Yeah. As being a man who chased after God. Yeah. Okay. D James, what do you want to be in your children's remembrance of you when they say dad? Uh, love. That, that's what that word means to them. Okay. My love for them and the love they saw that I had for God. Okay. Carla, what do you want? What is this legacy thing of remembrance? What do you want your children, your grandchildren, to remember about Granny? I, I want them to Bob. remember that, that I love God and that I took time and opportunity to share that God and faith with them. I, I want to be remembered like Bill Withers remembered his grandmother. Okay. You know, or uh, I think Fred Hammond sings a song about his grandmother been sick, yeah. and she said she didn't feel good, so he said, stay home. Mm -hmm. She said, mm-mm, to church I'm going. I'm got to go. Because, son, this body's tired, and the end is near. I want them to remember me persevering through any type of adversity <coughs> because godliness and holiness is so much more precious and important to me. Okay, okay. He This, this legacy thing, he says that it ought to be, in their remembrance, a blessing. So do y'all do y'all think about, in the present, what you are passing on to those that are in your family, particularly your children? Is it a conscious thought in you to ask yourself, what is it that I'm giving to my children that will go beyond the grave, my grave? What is it? What do you want them to remember from you? Oh, and then you're going to switch it up. <laughs> I want my children and my grandchildren to say that dad or papa lasted. I always saw him outlast trouble because he trusted God. I want them to remember that. See, I don't want to cry now. You, s <laughs> we started with verse one. You thought I was gonna make it through that? Ah, uh, <laughs> verse eight, <laughs> and we'll jump way over because I knew that some of these proverbs alone, we won't have. We just hit and miss on some of the stuff. We want to kind of highlight each chapters, what each chapter is saying to us. It says in verse eight, a wise heart accepts commands, but foolish lips will be destroyed. Y'all talk to me about that. This is a hard one because it means that I have to accept correction. Yeah. It means that I have to be told I'm wrong. Yeah. Whether the Holy Spirit is speaking to me and I accept that correction or whether Michael says, Mama Carla, when you did that, that wasn't, you know, it didn't represent Christ or, or whatever. Or, you know, because I'm, I'm always right. Yeah. And for me, but for me to be wise, I have to accept commands. I was looking through this, and I was thinking, I'm going to go back and do this. I want to just make a list of all the things that the, the wise person does. For instance, that I can say, wow, I bring joy to my father, and I, I'm a deliverer. I help people be delivered from death, and I, um, my hands are diligent, so I have wealth. I gather my crops in the summer, so I'm very prudent, and I have blessings because it's on the head of the righteous. And you just make a list of all those, and then also then make a list that says, I bring grief to my mother. I have things that I have gotten wrongly, and so they don't have any value. Um, I'm going to go hungry. Uh, I'm lazy. Like, take all the, the other side of the Proverbs and make a list of those and just... Rest in them. 
because I need to know that other side. Mm -hmm. And so that's that particular scripture, the wise in heart accept commands. Like I want to be able to accept commands, correction, or reproof, or whatever it is scripture has for me. And um, to just keep chattering, I mean, it just brings to ruin because I'm always making excuses for yeah. why I'm the way I am. Okay, okay, okay. And this was big, this album, because it's like he snuck it in in every chapter in some phrase mm -hmm. or some fun mm -hmm. to where the wise man don't mind being commanded or rebuked or however he phrased it, but the foolish one doesn't. Yeah. And it, but he, it's like he wanted us to understand. And, and, and I always go back to I have to understand you always taught us to do the author authoritative intent. Right. Know who the author is. Right. We're talking about the wisest man ever. Who keeps saying, if anybody should have been able to stand and say, you can't tell me nothing. It should have been me. It should have been, <laughs> yeah. been him. Yet often you keep hearing them say, I keep, I keep listening to commandments. I, keep, I, I, I accept rebuke. That's wise. And I'm thinking, well, if you can't tell, if you got to have to tell Solomon something every once in a while, what fool am I not right to take, on. take, uh, take uh, be able to listen to somebody say, hey, you yeah. wrong. And you need to fix that, cause I ain't never claimed to be wise in my own household, let right. alone comparing myself to, to Solomon. Solomon. Wow. And, oh, this oh. and this goes back, Pastor yeah. to, okay. to culture. Yes. And comparing to what the culture says to what what the Word of God, the standard says, the culture says, "We well, do what you want." Right. You're your own. You're your own person. You have one life to live. Mm. You know. Mm -hmm. And it also says everybody has an opinion. Everybody has a voice. Everybody can say what they want. Okay. But that's not what this is saying. At all. It's saying it's already been established. You need to accept it mm -hmm. and shut your mouth. All that's right. At least the destruction. That's right. <laughs> it's, I like that, Michael. That's good. I want to ask y'all a, a, a philosophical question about truth. Does truth have variations? Or is what's true always true? Two plus two will always be four. Okay. Y'all agree with that? That don't it, change. That, that's true. Two plus two is always four. Truth has no variation. Yeah. It is unwavering. Something may have been accepted as true in the past, and it wasn't, and, and it had to it had to change for the future. But it was it was already true then in the past. They just accepted it as truth. It wasn't true. Okay. And I think I think of slavery. Like I'm thinking that it was right to own slaves at a particular at time. At a particular time, that was somebody's truth, although it was a lie. Mm -hmm. The truth is that's not right, and that truth came forward. But that truth, what was accepted as truth then was not, and it's the same in, in my life. W in, in, in my life before Christ, there were things that I did or said that I owned as truth. They were not truth. When truth emerged, it brought forth what, what I thought was truth and showed that it was a lie. Okay. So, no, truth doesn't change. Truth is always the same. It's constant. It will always be the same. It has always been the same. What you accept as true may change, but truth itself does not change. Okay. Makes sense. Is there ever a time where it's relaxed? Two plus two will no. always be four. You ain't going to change that. And just because you in pre-K and don't understand it yet. Oh, that's good. <laughs> that's, <laughs> you know, that's good. It, 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 that doesn't change. That by the time you get to the second grade, or f first grade, two plus two is four. Y'all playing with me because truth must change due to the generation. Even though they're doing math wrong now, two plus two is They're doing it wrong. That's right. <laughs> two plus two is still yeah. four. Okay. Yeah. No, Pastor, it doesn't change. And when we find ourselves in that place mm -hmm. where we're thinking, well, is this really how it is? That needs to be turned to the inside and say, okay, now, like James said when he looked at his kids, well, what did I do for them to do that? That's where that needs to go because the truth is not wrong. In either generation. Even in the definition, the truth is not wrong. Okay. So if I'm seeing the truth differently, then the wrong is in me. Oh, okay. So there's never a generation where truth changes. Nope. Okay. Then 
Okay. Y'all, surely, this, listen. Then, can I compromise it? Can, can we make a, strike a deal? Do you not want two plus two to be four? I don't. I want, I want it to equal what I want it to equal, and it be true for me. Then How does that work? It don't. Put, here are my two fingers. You put up two fingers. Call a count them for me. One, two, three. One, two, three, four. And you can't. So you're telling me not only does truth not change, you're also saying that generationally, I can't compromise it. That it won't reach a compromise with me to be other than what it has always been. And, and the only reason I want to compromise is because I want to have my way. And so then I have to create a truth to justify to you what I'm doing is right. There's, I, that's what I laugh at, how you... How people change truth to say, well, then you see it's right. No, you might try to convince me that that's okay. right. But me and you both know it's wrong. Okay. Because you wouldn't even be arguing with me about it if you thought it was truly right. Okay. Then I got a couple of more things for y'all, and we'll call it good for the day. But I, there's a verse in verse 13. It says, wisdom is found on the lips of the discerning, but a rod is for the back of the one who lacks sense. Does life have consequences to choices? And what does that mean? Absolutely. Um, when you live a life that's pleasing unto the Lord, Pastor Webb, and you're trying to do right, uh -huh. God honors that, and he uses you uh, to help other people. Okay. And when you're living a life that's contradi a contradiction to that, <laughs> he'll use you too. Oh, okay. Amen. But in a different way, in a way that causes pain and suffering and dissension um, to try to get you to see the error of your ways and the consequence of your way. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll let Cindy go. Okay, so choices have consequences. Absolutely. It, it was in a book I saw that, and I hope I worded it right, that the pain of discipline exists. It just gonna be. It just determines whether you are on the right side of it or the wrong side of it. But the pain of discipline exists. You either go through the pain of discipline yourself to be righteous, mm -hmm. or you suffer the pain of discipline because you are unrighteous. Yeah. But the pain of discipline go exist, so you might as well try to be on yeah. the right the side, right side of, of it. And discipline <coughs> is both now and eternal. Yeah. And a lot of people um, think they're getting away with things when they're not disciplined immediately. Oh. Because they're what we're replacing is we're replacing an immediate satisfaction Ooh. for happiness, eternal happiness. And a lot of people are willing to make that trade because they can't see the pain, the suffering, and the punishment that's coming because of that immediate choice. Because right now, it feels, feels pretty good, and I'm getting what I want. Okay. Okay, so the text goes on down and says in another verse down there in verse 16, and it talks about uh, the reward of a righteous life and the wages of the wicked. So are there consequences or punishment for as a reward for wrong choices? And I'm calling punishment a reward. Is that true? That that there are, there is a reward for choices. Yes. Okay. Whatever choice you make, there's some payment that will be due. Mm -hmm. I mean, because that's what a reward is. You getting what you deserve. Okay. Yeah, you getting what you deserve. There, that's why I reward you, because you getting what you deserve. So if I don't go to work, I get a reward for that. Yeah. Yeah. What is it? <laughs> Po it's positive. <laughs> <laughs> Carl, is that true? That what? You get a reward either way? Yes. Yes. You can call it what you want to call it, reaping <laughs> and sowing, rewards, punishment, but you get your just due. Um, the old people say you're going to get your upcoming. Okay. okay. So, Michael. What is this then? that children feel entitled 
that if they don't go to work, that they should have a car, a home, and all that stuff. And parents ought to be, ought to foot the bill for that. Is that right thinking? What's the consequences of something like that? <coughs> spoiled kids grow up to be spoiled adults. Um, well said. Spoiled or rotten adults? Both. Um, yeah. And, and we think, we think uh, when, when you're not living... Uh, a life where you're receiving the knowledge of God and understanding how you should train up your child, then you do what you see. And if we go off what we see, what we see is that we should try to do better for our kids. That's true. But that bettering has a lot of variances. Mm -hmm. Bettering should be, I should have them in a better place in life, understanding, knowledge, in a relationship with God, those things are the priority of how they should be better than us. Okay. And those are the things we should be striving for, for them to be better than us in those areas. But what the culture is pushing for us to be for our children is, well, they need to have what they want. Mm -hmm. And they need to have more than the other kid that sits beside them in class. And if you're not doing more for them than what those parents are, then you're failing them. Okay. And that's absolutely a lie. Amen. And we're focused on the wrong thing. And by the time it's time for them to get out of our house, <laughs> a lot of times they're not given, getting out of our house because we wow. haven't taught them how to. Oh, there you go. That's good. That's good. The, the, and, and, and as you were saying, that, Mike, in the beginning, it's more about their parent than it is the kid because they can care less. Absolutely. They don't know the price of Jordans or the price of Kmart tennis shoes. They just got on tennis shoes want to go play and get dirty. Right. But as the parent, well, then you got to look better than uh, Mike. I, my kids need to look better than Mike's kids. So when we show up to church, they see my. Are you telling me yours. that adults really think that way? Oh, yes. Yes. And then you put that, you, that seed is now planted in that kid. So then all of a sudden when they get up and you still on a $50,000 a year budget. Okay. It was easy to do that when you was three because your shoes wasn't but $10. Now you want to maintain that. At a hundred twenty-five dollar shoe, but Daddy got to say no. You ain't said no all these other years. Right, right. So now right. you planted that seed. Right. Well, let's let's address one more issue before we close our time together. Out of these multiplicity and plurality of proverbs, verse twenty-one. I want to concentrate on the latter part, then the former. It says the lips of the righteous feed many. But the fool, but fools die for lack of sense. What does it mean to have sense or not have sense? Can you give me a practical example and explain? What does it mean to have sense or not have sense? My Bible uses places sense for judgment. Okay. Yeah. So to to not have sense or not have judgment is to not be able to assess right and wrong. Okay. Solomon calls it discernment. Discernment, right. Discern you cannot see right or wrong. It's just all gray mm -hmm. to you. Okay. And it says the lips of the righteous feed many. What does that mean? Carla, you're a wise woman. Speak to that, girl. <laughs> the lips of the righteous feed many. You know, I, I, I love sharing the word. I love sharing scripture because there is an answer for every ailment of mankind. And I was at a women's conference, and the Lord uh, made real to me. And the, the scriptures are talking about Jesus Christ and Isaiah. But for me, it became very real. It said that the sovereign Lord has given me the wisdom to know to sustain the needy. Okay. He's given me the words to know to sustain the needy. And he awakens me morning by morning and he teaches me. And all of a sudden, this, it like hit me in the face like bricks. And I sat in that conference for two hours just crying. Right. Because I realized that God had given me that gift that people come to me and, and they want and it's not me that they want. Mm -hmm. I know it's not me. And it's not mm -hmm. me that other people send them to for. 
but I know that I'm able to give them scripture and truth from here, and it helps to strengthen them and gird them up. And I always tell them, my joy is that you're going to be doing this for someone else. Yeah. To be able to share that. And so it's not anything of my own, but I, I so love doing it because I see the lights come on. I think I was reading something to you the other day that said wisdom or knowledge was knowing that a tomato was a fruit. Right. But wisdom is not putting a tomato in a fruit salad. Right. You know, That's like good. You, to know That's how good. to use that wisdom and know when to use it and, and when to display it and when to speak certain things in the people's lives. And it's always this. It's always a scripture that God gives mm -hmm. me to speak into someone's life. It's a it's a wonderful thing. I absolutely <laughs> love it. The lips of the righteous feed many, so says one verse. Another verse that we've read before says, wisdom is found on the lips of the discerning. Mm -hmm. And the last verse in this chapter says, the lips of the righteous know what is appropriate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this has nothing to do with physical food. Mm -mm. But it has to do with those who are righteous speaking life. And the only one that won't hear it is a fool. Out there listening to us, which are you? You got to answer that question. The Proverbs of Solomon, they speak to our heart. Amen. Michael, would you pray us out? Heavenly Father, we, uh, we're so grateful, Lord, that you would choose people like us, Father God. To yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Try to be those lips, Father. Mm. Father God, I ask that you would bless the hearer, Father God, that, that we would be honest with ourselves, Lord, and answer the question, which am I? Yeah. Yeah. And if we find ourselves on the wrong side of the fence, Father God, that we would jump over it quickly. Yeah. That you would quicken our feet, Father God, that you would speak to our heart and our mind, Lord, that we would get about your business, Lord. Yes, Lord. That we may be found as one of these people, Father God, that, that help produce life, Lord, through your word, Father God, as it, it can only come through you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the provision, Father God, and, and for the roadmap that, that you've provided for us, Father God. We don't have to think this up on our own, Lord. We just have to seek it and apply it with our lives, Father God. Father God, when we mess up, Father God, help us to get up quickly. Mm. <laughs> I think it's funny, Lord, that, that when that happens in the physical, Lord, like when we don't want nobody to see, like we slip and fall, we get up fast, Lord, and look around, Lord, to see, make sure nobody saw us, Lord. Right, right. Help us to do it in the spiritual, Father. Mm. Help us not to linger in that falling, Father God. Help us not to stay down too long, Father God, and grow comfortable and lazy, yeah. Lord. Yeah. Father God, be with your church, be with your people, Father God, be with our our city, our state, our country, Father God. Keep your hand of protection upon us, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Thank you, Michael, and thank those of you who are tuning in and know this, that you can do no better without his presence. Amen. God bless you and keep you as our prayer. Amen. See you next time. Uh, today, we will be on chapter 12, but we want to go back and kind of revisit a little bit of chapter 10, because when we were discussing about um, our discussion time in chapter 10, we, did, we didn't, we kind of overlooked something that we wanted to address. We want to look at verse 4, is that correct, y'all? We want to start there at least. What there did we not focus on that we might need to bring forward? Well, for me, on, on verse 10, chapter 10. Or, yeah, chapter 10, verse 4, was spent, sure, uh, the verse says, lazy hands make for poverty, mm -hmm. but diligent hands bring wealth. And we hit on one area of that, right. talking about um, being lazy and mm -hmm. uh, wanting others to do for you. There are other proverbs that say some people are so lazy they won't even lift their hand up to feed them themselves. So there, there, there is a segment of, of society that is like that, but that doesn't speak to all poor people. Yeah. For me, I wanted to make a point that I didn't see all poor people that way. 
or people that needed help that way or people that were on assistance of some kind that way because that's not always the case. And uh, I think I alluded earlier in that discussion in chapter 10 or yesterday, I can't remember, but that I was a teenage pregnant mom and I've been on government assistance before. Mm -hmm. Um, It was my goal in life to get off of it, but at that time and due to my own choices and my own mistakes, I needed that assistance and it was there. It just should not become a way of life. The other side of that is that I don't think the scripture is just talking about the poor. Right, right. I, I think it's talking about our essence and our being. It, it's so much broader than people that to be lazy as a Christian when studying the word brings poverty in my spirit, brings poverty to spiritual knowledge brings poverty to the wisdom that we're talking about. So uh, that laziness and our idleness could be for the person that actually gets up and goes to work every day. But you can still be lazy and trifling on your job. And so the fruit of what you could be bringing to that workplace is in poverty because of your laziness. Mm -hmm. So it's just so much broader than just people in need or, or poor people. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I left feeling like I didn't give that passage of scripture justice in my being. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Right. Carla, thank you. Michael? And I kind of felt some a similar way, Miss Carla. I don't think anything that we said about that scripture initially was wrong. Um, there's just more to be said mm-hmm. about it. You know what I mean? And... Um, Lazy hands make a man poor. Um, that's true. Um, but what's also true is not all poor people are lazy. Yes, right? exactly. And there's life circumstances. There's yes. Not everybody's story is the same, and uh, there's this life is not cookie cutter. Um, you can't, there's no formula that says if you do X, Y, and Z, um, everything's going to be fine. Right. And you won't have hardships. That's not true. Um, we at the church uh, help a lot of people, um, but I think I can say that the church tries not to do handouts. We try to do hand ups. Mm-hmm. We try to help people elevate themselves physically and spiritually from where they're at to where uh, the Bible instructs us to be, um, and that happens in love and in gentleness and and at times um, through a hard word. Absolutely. Uh, but there's two sides of that thing. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Michael. James, any words? Amen. 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 Well, you know, I, we want to be careful as we go through these Proverbs because we know others are watching. And we want to always speak truth, but we don't want it. We don't want the appearance of swaying one way or another. And I was um, so blessed yesterday when we finished up. Um, a recording a session that y'all brought up that your uncomfortableness about um, not exhausting chapter 10 enough so that we could clearly depict our point of view uh, to those who were listening. Oh, we just didn't want it to appear one-sided. One-sided. That we were so narrow-minded and so narrowly focused that mm-hmm. that's all we saw. Yeah, yeah. And you, you can't exhaust scripture, but you certainly don't want to become so narrow right. that you minimize God's intent. Yeah, or minimize people. Or um, minimize yeah. people, which is, yes, very yeah, important. Yeah, we're, we're uh, a lot of people are poor in spirit who are rich in merchandise. Yes. And, and material. So we just wanted to make sure that um, the overarching uh, concept about the poor anyway is that humanity was poor until the richness of Christ is poured into us. Mm-hmm into humanity by his dying on the cross the entire human race suffered poverty spiritually and could not find a way out of sin until the deliverance of he who owns heaven's riches is poured into us so are y'all satisfied i am are we ready to move on yes sir okay then we will conclude our time with chapter 10